the deep thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. So we got a bunch of stuff flying around in the air, don't we? Started off a very tangible balloon with a uh, some sort of rig that's supposed to be two times the length of a average city bus. Most people don't realize that, which means that the balloon is even bigger, right? So imagine you got two buses parked in front of you on the street, and you got a balloon that's big enough to pick them up and carry them across the sky. Now, that was about a week ago. And then all of a sudden, about February 11th or 12th of 2023, they start shooting all kinds of stuff out of the sky. In fact, they're shooting so much stuff out of the sky now that we're having a trouble trying to keep the the objects distinguished. You know, I've heard one over Alaska. I've heard definitely the one over Canada. Just about uh, an hour ago, I heard about another one over the Great Lakes. Tons of, uh, uh, and now they're called un- unidentified objects objects being shot out of the sky. Then Elon Musk puts out a really funny tweet, basically saying that he invited some friends of his with a little alien emoji to stop by. And then uh, within the hour or so, the White House comes out and assures everybody that they're not UFOs, that they're basically not extraterrestrial in any way, shape or form. Then Twitter blows up and, uh, well, obviously all the other social media platforms blow up. Rumble videos start coming out and they're talking about, you know, the the fake alien invasion, which we've been talking about on the show for at least seven years. It's been on the Internet for many decades before that. And it's been in the lexicon of man probably since supposedly Werner von Braun told his uh, his assistant, who is another Ph.D., that, that that's exactly what they were going to attempt. Ronald Reagan went up and inserted a paragraph into his speech in the early 80s about how unified the world would be if a bunch of aliens showed up and we all had to get together. And then you take a big deep breath of reality and you pull back and you're like, okay. You know, you can smell the BS a lot of times in life and the really the better you get at smelling BS, the more BS you can smell, Right. Now, at times, obviously, every human being is the victim of being gaslit so much, meaning being told a bunch of lies that perpetrate themselves as truth, that a couple of them get in, and then you kind of lose your bearings. You lose your orientation of, like, what's real and what's not real. You're not quite sure. Everybody everybody suffers from that. So I thought we would just recap and sort everything out a little bit here and then go from there because we need to have like a, I don't know what the hell you would call the opposite of gaslighting, you know, extinguishing, I don't know, extinguishing light, go down the street and just put out all the gas lights on Main Street. Sounds like a bad idea, but uh, metaphorically, it's a great idea. So how many of you, let's just do a virtual raise of hands here. How many of you think that an F-22 could be scrambled from the United States Air Force, fly up into the air, and shoot a UFO out of the sky. How many people think that we have that capability? Just, you know, no problem. And then, of course, that that would even be announced to anybody, right? Because the balloon was noticed by pedestrians. That's how the one that flew over Montana, that then was allowed to go completely across the United States and be shot down over the Atlantic Ocean... That's a, that's a very mortal looking thing. Lots of telescopes, lots of good photographs of it. Looked pretty normal to me. Blamed it on China. You know, and it's like, okay, well, maybe it's China. Maybe. Maybe it's Russian. Hell, maybe it's one of ours that went all the way around. Who knows? It didn't have a Chinese flag on it. Didn't have a Russian flag on it. Didn't have a United States flag on it. And it certainly doesn't look like anything extraterrestrial to me, right? So I'm going to tell you my answer to that. My personal belief is, is that if there was ever a UFO flying around that follows any of the characteristics of any of the sightings we have ever heard reported since man started documenting this, that you can't, you can't catch up with one if they don't want you to. And you certainly couldn't shoot it down with a rocket that's going to travel a lot slower than the vehicle itself, right? Why would that ever be the case? Well, the other thing, too, is that it's been an amazing distraction. 
And unlike other things, this is really phenomenal. Unlike other things, it's kind of keeping everyone's mind off of a bunch of bad news for a certain political group that's running the United States. A lot of the crazy tyranny that's coming down in all other countries other than the United States. Things like voting on whether or not we can use paper ballots in the United States. You're not even being talked about because look at these balloons and all these other things being shot out of the sky. So it's actually in one realm. Very brilliant, right? It could just be putting old junk in the sky, you know, from a scrap metal factory in China. They could just be attaching balloons to it and send it up. I'm going to watch this. It's going to blow them away, right? And we got a call from the Biden administration, you know, to help them out. And, you know, in return, we're going to get some tariffs reduced or whatever. They're still going for some reason. Isn't that weird? 45 put a bunch of tariffs on China. And then all of a sudden, uh, a new administration comes in and says that that was a super stupid idea. Ran on that platform. But none of those tariffs have changed, huh? I don't think that there's any piece of paper that could be bulletproof, right? That you sign it up, and even though it says this goes for eight years, that you can't just come in and knock it out of the, knock it out of circulation. Say, oh, it's a bad idea. We're going to get rid of that. And yet it still exists. Interesting, right? I don't want to turn it into a current affairs situation, but Palestine, Ohio, which is such a strange name for a town in Ohio, has had a big train derailment. A bunch of horrific chemicals have been blasting into the sky. Ironically, people took a bunch of photographs of birds just completely disturbed. Now, I understand if they're flying up in the in all the horrible chemicals, they're going to get agitated and potentially not slow down. But these chemicals have come down all over the city. Authorities haven't done enough to get people out of the area. But I know that when you get in the Ozarky kind of parts of uh, America, people don't necessarily respond well to evacuations. So you can probably chalk it up to everything going wrong from having the derailment of a bunch of chemicals blowing up, raging explosions, right? Police, I've seen videos where they're telling people to get out of town. You know, you're being evacuated. Go, go, go. And unlike California, when we had the fires and people did get out of town, even the ones in like Malibu and Calabasas, friends of mine fled when the cops came and said, you got to get out of here. They grabbed their belongings and they got out of there. Their dogs, their cats, everything, right? So that's kind of another fabric of distraction. The idea that they're going to hatch an alien invasion thing right now is very interesting. I don't see the evidence that that's what they're doing, but it's interesting how it just automatically plays out in the people's minds because surprisingly, encouragingly, it seems that millions of people around the world, and at least in the United States, people talking on Telegram, which is a pretty global community, even though most of them speak English, where I happen to peruse information, try to siphon it out and get it to you guys. They've all heard of the story. They've all heard of the story. I don't see reply chains where people are like, what are you guys talking about? Alien invasion, fake alien, what is that all about, right? Now, I've done several episodes on these UAPs, aka formerly UFOs, In a way, I think that the United States military has been fairly straightforward with the American people. And what's funny about it is it's the more the conspiratorial people that are worried about fake invasions. And then you have the ufologists and they're yanking at the story that the military is trying to tell you in so many ways, I should say, that the Tic Tac and the gimbal off the coast of San Diego was indeed a Navy aircraft. I told you guys that during the filming of Top Gun, they launched a vehicle in Area 51 that was really filmed in Area 51. Act 1, half of Act 1, was filmed in Area 51. Friends of mine, people I know personally, not just a chain of a chain of a chain, claimed they went around a corner, a bunch of employees were looking at this vehicle at the end of a runway. It started glowing. It looked like a saucer-ish kind of vehicle, but it was very far away. But these guys are 3D experts of spaceships. That's what they do. That's what they've been doing for 30 plus years. They got stacks of golden statues at home to prove it. 
And this thing lights up and blasts off into the clouds. It is literally gone within a split second from any viewable, discernible shape in the sky. And everyone jumped up and down and was super duper happy to have seen it. And then my friends, one I know, one I don't know, turned around, looked at each other like, oh my gosh, we just saw that or are we going to be in trouble? No one talked to them. No one debriefed them. No one told them they were gagged for 50 years or whatever. And that's, that's actually, a, I think, a very positive sign that they're willing to launch that during the filming of Top Gun Maverick. They could have postponed it a day. Eh, whatever. It's kind of scary in the sense that perhaps they know that something else is coming shortly and that it won't matter what anyone knows because you won't be able to talk to each other. I mean, that's a really wild thing. There have been uh, problems with the FAA computers all in the United States, apparently, where, you know, probably once a week now, we're having a, uh, an outage of computers, which brings all the planes to a halt for several hours. Every plane in the air is fine. They can get everyone down on the ground. But it's like an episode out of, like, Die Hard 2 which I don't know if you've seen that, but there's a lot of manipulation of the radar systems to cause all kinds of tragic, horrific things in the movie. In fact, I just recently watched that in the last couple months, and I was shocked at the sort of horrifying things that they portrayed in that movie. So it seems like, okay, if you're going to test things out, right, you're going to test whether or not you've got control over this, you've been installing the disruptive software, the viral software, and you, you just need to see if it's going to work. And then you kind of want to warm up the public to something, right? So you warm them up with a couple FAA cover stories. Now, again, with the, with the gimbal and the Tic Tac, and if those of you don't know, in the early 2000s, the Navy, uh, a.k.a. Air Force, was tracking with some of their top guns at the time. Two vehicles, one looked like a giant Tic Tac and one that looked like sort of a kind of a dreidelish gimbal looking object and they filmed it and of course they didn't film it in any color camera i mean these things have 10 million dollar cockpits in them and they they you know they're unable to get great footage of them i did a whole episode on the ufo hearings where they basically said this is not extraterrestrial there's no indication it's extraterrestrial even though these vehicles weren't being identified as to where they came from. And they could do things that none of the vehicles that we have above board have been announced to be able to do. And again, they're not really, at this stage, okay, showing signs of being able to carry any level of ordnance. I'm sure you could probably put a camera on one of them. And maybe you could probably create a, you could definitely, I mean, I think we can all assure ourselves that the biggest weapons that we have created could be put on them in terms of atomic uh, fission weapons and hydrogen weapons and that kind of stuff. Probably could do that. Probably could. Don't know. Then Dr. Stephen Greer takes a really interesting interview with a guy who was stationed in Guam. It's one of the most peculiar interviews, and I've talked about it a couple of times on different shows. In case you missed it, he interviewed this gentleman who said that he was just sort of an average guy. He was a... He was... I don't know what the official rank would be called, but he goes out on a ship that's very old that picks up buoys from the ocean, cranes them on board, they clean them off, they service any of the electronics, put it back in the water. So they have a giant crane, and that's what they do. And he was one of the crane operators. And so they get in this ship, they kind of called out, it seemed like in some emergency situation and they go out in the ocean and it's Guam. So it's nice and equatorial, nice and warm. And a, and a fisherman in a fisherman's boat, which is rickety, had caught this vehicle in his fishnet. And I think that the average dynam diameter was something like 20 to 30 feet. And I know that's a giant jump between those two, but I can't quite remember what he said. This vehicle was actually floating in the water for the most part. It was some sort of purplish gray steel, completely smooth, no openings, no windows, no doors, and it was stuck in this net. So before they actually get to the ship, they force the entire crew to go down under deck, 
these other dudes showed up in black suits and were covering up all the portal windows that were facing the vehicle. And I believe just two of them, one of them being this, this gentleman in the interview, were allowed to come above board because they were the only ones that could operate the crane. And then some scuba divers from somewhere else, and of course the black suits. As soon as they get to the vehicle, they don't speak the native language that this gentleman spoke, which I can't remember what that was, but they eventually get across, convince the guy to stop the boat. I'd love to hear that conversation. Whether well, it was money or guns, one of the two, right? Then they needed to lift this vehicle out of the water, and they got to get the guy's fishnet off the vehicle, and then they got to figure out a way to lift this really peculiar shape which doesn't have a hook on top like the buoys do, and get it on top of the boat, then cover it up and get it back to the coast. Well, interestingly enough, the story actually didn't get crazy. The guy said, look, we have these spools of rope ladder that we consume on a regular basis. We drop them down in the water, and then at some point we cut them off and we throw it away, and then we drop new ones down. And so they took this big spool of rope ladder and wrapped the vehicle in several different axes, above and below, above and below, above and below. And that was able to lift it into the ship. Now, all I can say is, he said this stuff was nylon, so it was extremely almost like like FedEx bag kind of stuff, right? It's a really durable rope. But he said when they lifted the thing into the boat, it nearly capsized. And he goes, what's strange about that is, I believe the, the amount of weight that this crane was designed for in a maximum capacity was about 45,000 pounds. And they were definitely over that um, allocation. And the interesting thing was, is that it wasn't taking on water. It didn't have openings. So you're not lifting a big pool of water, which would make it extremely heavy. This was just the native weight of this vehicle. He said by the time they got it on the dock, he was able to touch it. He said, you know, it was a weird, slicky, smooth metal. He knocked on it, which he said was a very dull sort of ring, like it was hollow inside, but it must have had a pretty thick hole. So they get it all the way back to Guam. And as soon as they get back to the shore, he says there was a bunch of brass from the military, from the Navy and the Air Force, like generals. Uh, thing was all tarped up. It's evening, but you can still see it uh, underneath. The, I mean, you can see whatever shape is underneath the tarp. All the people were allowed to leave the ship without cleaning it up because this thing was going to be taken off the ship in sort of a top secret way. One of the commanding generals told the soldier CO and him and the other guy that he wants to see him tomorrow morning, like 0600, and they're going to get debriefed on what the heck just happened because they saw too much, you know? Well, the next day, they go in for the debriefing, and the general, I think, probably told them the truth. And he said, look, this is just a covert Navy vehicle, you know, made in cooperation with probably some sort of skunk works area 51 Wright patterson air force base you know skunk works design and that's all it is his co the man in between the ranks basically blurted out that he thought it was bullshit of course the two underlings are just keeping their mouth shut and that's really the end of that particular story there and there was another story about him bumping into a guy at the bar there on guam and he was some sort of special forces guy who said that he had just come back from the dark side of the moon and was very disturbed about what he saw. So, you know, I don't know if that's, again, gaslighting good information and corrupting his um, his valid story, right? So then you could go, ah, well, you know, the story sounded good until you met the guy in the bar that said he was on the dark side of the moon. Okay. Again, there's a big problem with just getting out of the vehicle on the moon, even if you can get there. You know, what's the surface made out of? Is it truly solid? You know, is it a big plasma ball covered in white dust that's oxidized to white? Unlike any other body we've ever seen in space, this thing is looks like burnt ash, right? But that's another conversation. What's interesting about the state of the world today is obviously there's a lot of attempts to poison the entire world. That it's very imperative that you poison yourself. To stay healthy. We are now, I would say, bordering, I'd say at least 80 years. Some people could take it back to 100 years, honestly. But we're definitely within 80 years of decade after decade of advice being given to human beings. 
by profound medical institutions as being the worst advice you could possibly have taken to keep yourself healthy. Now, some of the more basic things that just came up from society and not profound medical institutions is, hey, everybody, maybe you should take a bath every once in a while. Shower if you can. Just kind of clean off all the bacteria that's on the outside of your body because it can get out of control. You can get things like polio if you don't get rid of this kind of stuff. You can get leprosy if you don't get rid of this stuff. And as society has introduced you know, cleaning regiments, a bunch of stuff went away. Everybody was getting healthier. For some corporations, their customers were drying up. So they became part of the problem in order to keep themselves afloat. And that was too obvious. So they had to split those corporations apart. They had to create things like the World Trade Organization to make sure that just by design, all consumable foods, waters, and everything are as made as either non-nutritious as possible or, indeed, full of up to 76 pesticides that are used at lethal levels for the human body. So, alien invasion. Hmm. Now, what's interesting about alien invasion theory, and aliens arriving at all, is what I recorded, I think, in my first 10 episodes, one of my most proud episodes, it, even though it, it kind of sucks. I went back and rewatched it from season one. It's called Alien Promise. The theory is great, in my opinion. But it has to do with this theory that we want aliens to arrive because they're going to come with Klaatu's cure for cancer. There won't be any problems to serve man by the Twilight Zone crew. Well, what was the uh, benefits of to serve man? When big uh, was it Lurch came in the room dressed like an alien, he gave them cures to diseases and he gave them, very importantly, Ways to create food in abundance so deserts could be turned into lush, incredible gardens. Everyone was eating great. Everyone was getting fat and happy. Because in the end, their goal was to serve man as a food, right? Now, if you haven't seen an episode that's over 60 years old, I'm not spoiling anything for you. The idea is that the entire agenda of the world would be inverted if we had true extraterrestrial beings showing up. At least, according to the science fiction that's been put on TV and in movies. Now, science fiction, say, space horror, ah, then you get into maybe a reptilian race, like V, that's here to take over the world and make it horrible. But then again, do you think you could scramble an F-22 just to shoot him down I will? Nah. But then another conspiracy arrives that's been around for, I don't know how long. I discovered it probably between 2015 and 2017, which was this notion that satellites don't exist. That because satellites definitely, definitely are put on balloons and sent up into the upper atmosphere to do things, because we see them crash in foreign countries, and there's iPhone videos of these things all around the world, even even to the point of almost a science fiction novel where it's like beep, 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 and they're looking for it in the desert, I mean in the desert, in a jungle of like, say, Viet Vietnam, and they'll find this thing. I've seen a video of that whole thing, you know, these, these people that don't have that technology at all, whoa, 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 check this thing out, right? There's videos of them launching them from these kind of wood scaffolding Launch zones, right? Almost looks like you can hang, do a hangman on the thing, but it's actually launching these balloons in the sky. And then we do have rockets that go up into the air, and they go out of view, and then we're told what's happening. What's fascinating about that is that obviously a bunch of fanboys for either NASA or uh, SpaceX, or perhaps a foreign agency... Well, they'll sit there and wax poetic about how that's absolutely 100% real and that everything that we saw, like the SpaceX uh, jet, you know, jet booster footage, which in one case looked like it had a mouse that actually crawled out and he was making his way around the vehicle and, you know, whatever. Of course, anything organic would freeze to death, explode due to pressure problems if all the science... science uh, is correct, right? 
is it is a very interesting thing to sell out of sight, out of mind, isn't it? What's funny about the whole thing of rockets going up into space and then someone telling you what actually happens using graphics, right? NASA's just unabashful about it. They show you CG react, reenactments of these rovers supposedly landing on Mars and everyone's just buying it up. It's fascinating to see how they just eat it up. But then when you show them a deep fake on the internet, the new voice technology that Elon Musk just demonstrated where he was talking like all kinds, like Joe Biden and all kinds of cartoon characters and other actors and famous people, they still believe the footage on the back of the rocket is still true, that the footage inside the roadster that went into space is still true, that the Earth is this, this little tiny marble, especially when the roadster went up. I mean, Earth was like changing shapes like crazy. The Red Bull guy that jumped from, what, 80,000 feet is just staring at a marble in the sky when he's not high enough at all to see the Earth at that shape. Put through GoPro software and other software that I've actually used when I was teaching one of the first accredited VR classes here in Southern California. It straightens all the footage out. And all of a sudden, wow, Earth looks flat as a... <laughs> Flat is flat, right? And that's, even if it's a ball, it's supposed to be that flat when you're just that shallow distance off the surface of the earth. And I want to repeat, and I don't want to make this, you know, a shape earth episode by any stretch of the means, but when I was involved in um, a startup that I, that I put together to invent high definition LED movie theaters, we were dealing with optics a lot, how the eye worked because we needed to understand how polarized 3D worked versus shutter 3D whether or not we would be able to would, whether or not we would be able to make a screen that could do 3D without any glasses just understanding how the eye worked i did a ratio once uh, when i had all the data in front of me of like when would when would the earth if a ball appear curved without any arguments from any human being because you might, everyone who anticipates it to be curved is going to say, well, I looked out the plane at 36,000 feet and I could see the curvature there. It's like, no, you couldn't. No, <laughs> you're looking at either the distortion of the two lenses you're looking through that are the window you're looking through, or you're just making it up in your brain. You just can't see a curvature at 35,000 feet. That's only, you know, six miles in the air. However, if you get to 80 miles up, which is 5,280 feet times 80, you have enough resolution in your eye sockets and enough curvature out whatever window you're looking at that you will start seeing the curvature of the earth. You will. Now, what's interesting about that is I just recently heard a really funny interview with an SR-71 pilot. He was talking about flying all over the United States within two hours. And that's just, just what they did all the time to train and get more hours inside the vehicle. He said that when he was over Phoenix, he could see Los Angeles because he's traveling about 79,000 to 80,000 feet in the air. I thought that was pretty cool. And the joke was that back before GPS and a lot of the advanced technologies, if you wanted to know what your airspeed was, if you wanted to confirm with ground control what your airspeed was to so make sure your instruments are reading correctly, you could just broadcast your, your um, ID. Everybody could hear it on a particular CB channel, right? And then you'd have the ground control come back and say, we've got you at this, this uh, speed. And what the guy indicated was that one after the other, someone would call in to top the next guy. So you'd have like a, a single engine prop plane call in then you'd have like some commercial Cessna with turbines then you had I think an uh, I think an F14 would call in and each one of them or no F18 excuse me they keep calling in and to the point where yeah it kept getting bigger and bigger and this guy waits to the very end and then he calls in his ID for the SR71 and there's a pause on the radio and the guy comes back and says uh you know we're tracking you about 1900 miles an hour and the only thing he re replied was, well, we're, uh, we're tracking a little closer to 2000. So could this whole balloon thing be some stimulus for another agenda outside of a UFO thing? Because again, I'm just going to remind you, 
One of the reasons why you know the Tic Tac and the Gimbal is a military vehicle is because it's only been seen flying over water. What happens if the thing's engine fizzles out? It took them over 10 years to share that footage with the, uh, with the world at large. Well, it's got to be looked at, examined, probably modified, sent through a thousand filters so you can't actually see what it's doing. But if it's flying over the ocean and it loses its engine, it plops into the ocean. And then they just go pick it up like the guy in Guam. No big problem. But if you fly a thing over Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, and it loses its motor, then it's going to hit the ground. And that's going to cause a lot more problems. The cleanup's going to be horrific. Maybe you kill a few people. Even if you're over a field, you never know. Plus, you're going to leave an imprint in the ground that could later be, you know, examined. You don't want any of that. Now, on the East Coast, there was a claim, and there's a video, that it flew inland of, you know, maybe a quarter mile over a naval air, uh, naval base. And so, you know, if it, then if it, you know, kind of lost its thing, uh, at least it would be in military space to be cleaned up. I'm assuming that vehicle was fresh out of the gate so that they made sure it was stabilized, had plenty of energy in it, and wasn't going to crash. But the footage wasn't that convincing, to be honest. Little specks flying around inside footage is hardly impressive, and hardly difficult to simulate. For all we know, the gimbal and the tic-tac never ever existed, and it's just bad CG. The only validation we have that existed was that Top Gun people saw it. And they went on interview circuits. And again, one guy, a lot of older gentleman, was super excited to be in the interviews. And then there was a younger woman who was also another Top Gun pilot. I think she was potentially, I think, in a different vehicle. Don't quote me on that. But she looked horrified to be in the interview as to, you know, whether or not she's really, you know, given permission to talk about this kind of stuff. And several times in a 60 Minutes episode in Australia, where they're being interviewed... Why didn't we see that in America? I don't know if that even happened in America. But she's looking at him like, is this okay? We talk about this? And he's just like, ding, ding. He's all happy. Well, what if they brief that guy in full and they barely brief her or debrief her? So he's got all the answers. It's a game, man. Love to know his Mason uh, membership status, right? But what are the other agendas that are sort of incubating? Certainly would take your mind off a president that, uh, before he was president, seems to lose a lot of confidential documentation. Has a son that's a crack addict and impregnated his niece who had his baby. Mm, got some bad controversies going on there. What if you wanted to take a lot of that steam off of your family and yourself? Well, quite frankly, anything is okay. And, you know, it's been in my experience that when a politician's in, in trouble, it doesn't matter really what camp they come from. You're not safe in your own house. You just aren't. When the neocon conservatives want to do something, they take down Twin Towers to start gigantic wars in the Middle East that turn out to be completely useless, but cost trillions of dollars that are then laundered through their personal organizations like Halliburton, Unical. When it comes down to the other party, well, there's a lot of mass shootings, isn't there? Sort of like they're all on the same team, but one handles the more domestic situations, and their party really starts with a D. It's pretty interesting. And the other party takes on more global things. Both are the same party. They use campaign slogans and various controversies around the world to make you believe that they're actually on the opposite side. They even drum up issues to piss you off. One side will be for it, one side will be against it, and of course, society immediately divides because they both have fan bases. But I think it's very interesting, the first balloon was blamed on China. And of course, the rumor floated around this was happening during the last administration's presidency as well. Now, I think most of us know that if any of that was ever reported to 45, the actions would be extremely swift and would have gone far beyond shooting it out of the sky. It would have gone to economic sanctions and potentially some more militant responses. What are they doing up there? Hmm. That might get to the motive as to what on earth these things would be there for. Well, part of it's just testing the waters. Let's just put it up there and see what they do. 
Could they have put something up there and lost control of it? Eh, maybe. Uh, the Chinese newspapers over there, they seem to claim at least the first one with the big truss on it that was the size of two buses. They seem to claim that one, and then they blew it off. Now, let's say you've got a balloon up there with a bunch of electronics on it, and you do sense these things the second they launch because you're the, you are the United States military. There's nothing that, that reaches 30,000 feet or 40,000 feet or even higher without us knowing about it because we have aircraft that do all kinds of maneuvers all the time. Plus, we want to know if bombers are coming our way, missiles are coming our way. When it moves very slow, obviously, the artificial intelligence will tell whoever is looking at the data this is not, you know, a missile. But it has a bunch of electronics on it, supposedly, right? Eh, cameras, what have you. And you have to understand, too, that the inside of the balloon can have a lot of instruments inside of it as well that are covered up by the balloon itself. Like the transmission mechanisms to get the data back to its source. Well, what if we have technology, especially over Alaska, to fry that thing? To just melt it with EMP waves? I mean, if they haven't built that stuff out of some extremely strong and extremely classic electronics, it's just going to melt, especially all the chips. They would at least have to shield it in a way that the thing would weigh a lot. So you put some aircraft by with that technology on board, maybe an AWACS of some sort, and you just sock it and rock it and turn it into a floating piece of rubble. Then who cares if it flies over the United States? What I find interesting is the Pentagon never took that tact and said, well, we discovered it over Alaska and we take the proper procedures to eliminate its threat. Then it's just a piece of metal floating over the United States. And then we monitored to make sure it's not going to lose altitude and land in a major city. Then it would have calmed everyone down. They could have said that. They're not stupid. And we know the technology exists. But the fact they didn't say it, ah... Uh, that means they want a controversy to exist. Letting the thing fly over the United States when it's found floating over Montana. For those of you who don't know anything about the United States, Montana is a very sparsely populated state. It's less populated, I believe, than Kansas. And I'm going to tell you right now, you could shoot a balloon down over Kansas probably in 95% of the regions. And since things that go up come straight down, you don't need to worry about shooting it in square A and having it float away and hit another city because it's going to hit, you know, from, say, a shot over square A, it's not going to float to F and land in Kansas City. It's going to go straight down inside A. So you just look down, you say, there's a farm. We'll talk to the farmer, we'll let him know. We've got all kinds of agents that can get to places in two seconds, and we have everyone's cell phone, so we'll make all the phone calls, and we'll shoot this thing out of the sky over Montana. No problemo. Didn't do it, did they? See, the thing was a complete ruse to make sure everybody's panicking or getting systematically more and more impatient and angry with China, which is really strange, because the current administration has ties to China Probably more than the, the Ming Dynasty ever had, right? Taking money like an ATM from that place to do whatever they want us to do with their artificially inflated currency, which really doesn't have the value that they state it does. But it's an honor system, right? It's a closed system of economy where we can't audit how much currency they've printed versus how much they've got to back it. So they're allowed to say out of thin air what their money's worth, and we believe it. And then they use that artificial inflated currency to purchase a bunch of farmland, a bunch of properties, a bunch of businesses. That's a game unto itself. The idea is a spy satellite. Okay. Well, again, the first one that we saw was very, very human. Extremely human. We have Google Maps which is sometimes called Google Earth. Same technology, different applications. Same exact database of images, to be honest. And they have photographed the entire planet. Now, of course, Google will not go against the United States military slash government and publish, say, 
truly accurate images of covert areas like Area 51. They'll simply submit the images, have them edited, and submit them back into the database. Nothing will be published in Google Maps willy-nilly without oversight. So in terms of all of the missile silos and that sort of thing, well, it just depends. There's a bunch of missile silos around Wichita, Kansas. I don't even know how many, but when you grow up there and you drive by fields and you see these lumps of concrete surrounded by barbed wire fence, well, you can see them from the highway, let alone from the sky. So if you could, you, if you really wanted to know where those things are, you could just hire a bunch of Chicons to take a bunch of flights all around Kansas and you would pretty much be able to map them, especially if they have any intuition and cartography of any kind or are trained to do so. Well, then they could also rent a plane and just fly around. They could hire an American pilot just to do loops. So I really don't think that there's anything on the ground that is unknown to the Chinese government or any major government in the world. So what are they spying on? Well, the second tier of the theory was that they were spying spying on communications between satellites. Now, that could be anything, right? Military, private, And the insinuation is is there's no other way to do it, or there's no other better way to do it than to put something kind of between the two broadcasting station and the satellite that's bouncing it off into other areas of the world. But most of the data collection that happens in the United States and around the world that is absolutely a threat to mankind and violates whatever eavesdropping constitution that countries have is broadcast and transmitted on the ground. We're told that a lot of communications goes over satellites, especially between places like Australia, New Zealand, uh, between the United States and Europe, any place that has a big body of water between it. And then you start seeing these images of all of the manual cables that are on the bottom of the ocean that they have been stringing around for probably around 100 years. The ships that can audit those cables. I mean, it's just really a phenomenal thing. They take these ships, they go to the coast, they put the gigantic cable over the hull of the ship. And so the backside of the ship, the aft, is going back to land. And over the bow of the ship, in the front of it, it's pulling it off the bottom of the ocean, and then they can look at it on the hull. They can open it up, put new electronics in it, fix a broken connection. Now, I'm not sure exactly what they do if if those cables could ever get severed on the bottom of the ocean. I think that would be very, very rare that that would ever happen if it wasn't sabotaged by a foreign country. Plus, they have a lot of redundancy. So in terms of what goes in the air, well, you know, if you're over a theater of war, there's a ton of encrypted packets of information going back and forth. And the ciphers are rotated constantly, so your capability of of decoding the Enigma machine of the packets of information in any way that would be useful to you is almost, well, it's, it's categorically negligent. A sortie that takes off and gets commands to do something, well, as long as you watch the sortie and where the bombs dropped or where they did whatever they needed to do, you're going to be able to see its finale before you're ever going to be able to decode the packet. Now, the one shot over Canada slash Alaska over Lake Huron, I think that's the way you say it, H-U-R-O-N, was a smaller metallic balloon that had an object tethered to it. I mean, quite frankly, this is almost breaking news as I talk about it. They're out there trying to recover it. The interesting thing was is that the... uh, The way that they've sort of announced this is that Trudeau and Biden both came together and both agreed it should be shot out of the sky, thus clearing the airspace for the F-22 from America to do the deed. You know, in a way, it's kind of interesting to see America and Canada working together on anything. Now, what I think is kind of funny is that there's sort of like this subliminal insinuation, and it's understandable and it may even be scientific, that no one really suspects this to come from Russia because people assume that Russia can get that information and has 
achieved the procurement of information without any balloon technology being used. But everyone assumes that China lacks the technology to do this any other way. And quite frankly, I'm on board with that. The problem, I think, with the China being a huge threat to everyone is, eh, it seems like most Asian countries, save Japan, are using propaganda to prop up their organization. For instance, North Korea saying they have a nuclear weapon. Hilarious. It's just hilarious, right? You know, even though above-ground nuclear testing has been banned since 1973, Kim Jong-un's father and son would definitely detonate something above ground if they had it, just to threaten the entire world. We haven't even seen an underground test, at least to my knowledge. There's been a big explosion by a train station several years ago that they cleaned up, yada yada. But there's absolutely no proof, and so the only thing you have is a bunch of people claiming things. Now, are there weapons out there that are for sale? Uh, Maybe, especially if Red Mercury's real. Go see my episode on that. But China's playing a very dangerous game. They're threatening the world over and over in different ways. They're using fake money to buy influence. The European countries are going along with it because, well, they get a ton of cheap labor. It's definitely a deal with Faust if there ever was one. Chinese Navy is currently powered by diesel fuel. They've got a giant aircraft carrier that's one of the biggest aircraft carriers ever built except it's still in the dock and can't go anywhere. If it does happen to go anywhere with a big belly of diesel fuel. Well, I dare say that bunker buster technology from even 2003 would rip that ship apart in two seconds. It would be an X ship the second they try to deploy any of that stuff. They don't really have an army to threaten anyone with. Now, if their soldiers could somehow magically teleport from the coast of China to the coast of your country, my case, America, yeah, There'd be a hell of a hand-to-hand combat situation because I do not underestimate a human body. You know, the Japanese proved that, you know, just four decades into a modern industry, they were damn near impossible to defeat. I mean, you know, it was a very formidable enemy. But China hasn't been in a war for over like, you know, 400 plus years. I think one expert said 450 years. Every single time Europe showed up to bombard their coast to make sure they bought opium from, was it the East Indian Company, as put forth to them by the Queen of England, or King of England, can't remember which one was in power at the time, this is several hundred years ago, they just caved because this was super duper technology. Now hopefully we don't go to any blows with anybody, it's a stupid pastime like I've always said, war is just stupid. And I know that sometimes you can get caught up in a military mindset and say, well, that's just the way it is. I'm not going to totally disagree with you because there's always a bully in the playground. And you got to strike that guy down. Then the the problem is, is maybe the country that you belong to, even though the citizens aren't bullies, the politicians who have no skin in the game, right? They have no relatives that have been drafted, no relatives that are active duty. Oh, well, they're throwing around your kids like they're meat bags, right? What I think is encouraging is that the balloon situation, especially as it relates to anything extraterrestrial, which I don't know that I've had a single conversation with people, or a person, excuse me, that believes that. The beauty is it's not going in a really dark place yet. Even the press, who likes to spin us every which way but loose, has not spun it in any super dark way. Now you might chalk that up to, well, you know, it's uh, it's because it's China and we always protect China. You might be right. But again, a lot of this stuff could be handled covertly. It just could be. And the only thing you're going to have as a contradictory narrative is some guy hiking in Alaska that goes, man, I saw this thing fly by and shoot something out of the sky. Well, to be honest, I can't believe I haven't heard that balloons have not been used as a part of a training exercise. Yeah, it's just throw up a bunch of balloons over some, you know, with almost nothing on them. And let's just have F-22 shoot them out of the sky. Let's just practice that. Even just for dogfighting alone. Because think about it, when you watched Top Gun Maverick, which is very accurate to the way that the war games work for aircraft, they're obviously not shooting missiles at each other. 
But there's going to be nothing like the experience other than shooting a missile. When you grab the joystick and you deploy the missile and poof, it rattles off the, the wing or it comes out of the bowels of your ship. There's nothing that's going to be like that unless you actually do it. So it seems like weather balloons would be a great practicing situation. So I think that my point here with that particular point is that they could keep it secret if they wanted to, except for when they let gigantic multi-bus wide diameter balloons float over a very populated area, at least to the point where people can look up and go, what's that? There are telescopes everywhere in the world because there's a nerd in every single major city and little town. So if you're going to let it get within viewable range, you know, what is it? The, uh, the, the 200 zoom Sony cameras can pick them up, let alone a telescope. But let's, let's kind of venture out into more of the, uh, fringy side of sort of conspiracy, just to have a little fun before this thing's over. There was a famous letter online that did a lot of talking through posts online. Never identified themselves entirely, insinuated who they were, insinuated they were more than one person, as a matter of fact, using an alias. But they said that 45 would be the last president and there's been all kinds of skepticism as what the hell that means. Countries need leaders. They do. So how that could ever be true, I don't know. Last president of an incorporated corporation? Eh, okay, that's one angle. What are we going to do? Start calling them chancellors here in America? Give me a break. Now, obviously, that didn't happen. Obviously, a different guy came in and he calls himself president. Even though in the Hall of Presidents, where they keep track of the most current president and the past president, all of the, the artwork in the building, which is just a you know, few blocks away from the White House, they still have 45 as the current president, and they have not put 46 anywhere in the building except on a poster that looked like a child created it in some sort of layout product on sort of like a portable, expandable poster easel thing. Hilarious. But now let's take the alien uh, visitation thing. Because what was really interesting is when 45 got to the end of his presidency, he took an interview with his son. And at one point, there was a great emphasis on extraterrestrials. And there wasn't any specificity to the conversation except the reference of the famous event, 1947, called Roswell. And that finally got 45 to look at his son and say, yeah, what about that one? That's, that's something we need to investigate. Now again, yours truly, I went through my adolescence going, oh, really? That, there was this thing? I didn't know much about it because the internet didn't exist. You couldn't just look everything up in two seconds. Then as sort of the internet came around, by the, probably about by 2007, I was writing articles online saying, I think that the entire UFO phenomenon has been invented by countries to give other countries the sense that they have captured these devices and you better not mess with us because man we got this sort of like the North Korean we're going to build a thing that looks like a missile take it to a parade on occasion the tip of the missile is going to kind of be dangling off the paper mache thing but this is more of a first world version of that right for a long time it was only the United States of America that ever claimed to have captured a flying saucer, at least in the, you know, the first article that was written about Roswell. I went down that path, you know, and I, I went in to prove it wrong, as so many people have done with various topics over the years, and then I became a believer. And I'm trying to find a way to crack it. And every time I dug deeper and deeper, I found more manipulation of individuals, more harassment of individuals, that if it weren't true, why are these guys constantly getting called? And I became a believer, and I, I restricted all my research to the people that were either first-degree friends of the people that saw the material, or the people that actually saw the material and the creatures themselves. What would happen to your country and my country if these beings, any beings, started to show up and sort of take over the game? Or they had the capability of leading us as a planet, and therefore individual leaders Eh, maybe they don't have as much necessity in the world. What if last president meant that there was this negotiation to go ahead and make contact, 
Because the one thing we haven't really ever talked about is them actually doing it, them actually showing up, and it's not a ruse. It's not a fake. It's real. Now, I have no indication that that's going to take place, so don't think I've got some drop I'm about to give you, some secret to create clicks, you know. But if they exist, then that's a... Isn't that sort of an obligatory moment in time? It's going to occur. We're just waiting for all the the stars to align. And then, of course, comes the question. Are they good in terms of man's values? Do no harm? Or are they bad? Now, I don't think they're going to turn us into a slave race. I don't buy that kind of thing. Why would they need that? I'm sure automation in every category of everything is a done deal. And automation means no one gets sick, no one complains, and automation works 24-7, according to the size of the earth, right? What would be interesting, and I've never heard this theorized by any ufologist of any kind, and maybe it has, I've not even heard it claimed on Coast to Coast AM where all the, the uh, intelligence agents pretend to be things and they, they practice their sort of role-playing online on phone calls live, right? Which is why they get caught up immediately once the questions start coming in from the population. They start sounding like morons because their story doesn't have all of the ins and outs. But the question would be, pick your alien race of choice. Let's say the greys. Have you ever thought about what their government might be like? How are they staying organized? Are they a commune of people, of beings, I should say, that just simply autonomously follow the rules, no one steals, no one lies, and they just get stuff done. They're exploring the universe, because why not? It's a big place if it's what they say it is. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter where you think you are, there's always an explanation for beings from another place, created by God, that are just simply going to the four corners of whatever paradigm, whatever cosmology you think you might be in. And quite frankly, it's a good test from our Creator to us, to see what we would do with someone who is benevolent, someone who is wonderful, peaceful, what would the human psyche do? If a farmer runs out and shoots him with a shotgun, well, he fails the test, right? But if we're to assume, under a scenario, I mean, surely the military is considered this, even if they don't have a single scrap of extraterrestrial debris, that there needs to be a protocol. The inverse of the prime directive, we are being contacted, what do we do? They come in with a full force governmental or at least some sort of organizational model that has obviously yielded their civilization to travel further than we've ever traveled or travel interdimensionally. I mean, however you slice that apple, man, it's pretty darn impressive, right? It would be, even if they're reptilian and crazy. The thing about the reptilian thing, which is why I can't get into it, is that, you know, they're supposedly, you know, everyone's a shapeshifter who's in charge and stuff, but they just can't take over the planet. I mean, they've got all this capability of doing this crazy shit, and, you know, I don't know a single soul that's ever bumped into them. You know, I got lots of friends. I got lots of celebrity friends who have met tens of thousands of people every decade of their life, and there's no talk about that stuff with them. You know, someone coming up and blinking in a, you know, a slit eye or something. Seems like somebody would have that story, other than David Icke, right? So an alien civilization shows up. I'm like, okay, here's the thing. You don't need this, you don't need that, because we're going to take care of everything. Why do you need a government? Well, you need to protect and serve, right? Well, we're going to protect you, trust me. There won't be any more wars on your planet. It's a waste of resources and it violates every code of ethics of life. So we're putting an end to it. Well, then what? We're not going to magically, genetically upgrade, because even if they gave us a a tighter, denser neural net in all of our brains, you still got to teach that brain what they know. And unless they're able to beam down a bunch of kung fu, we're not going to know what they know. If they're truly who we think they might be in terms of the mathematical probability of them being more evolved than us, 
That could be a million years more advanced. It could be 10,000 years more advanced or 10 million years more advanced. How are we going to make up that difference to be compatible? I'm sure they understand that if they exist. You know, and there's this, uh, there's this UFO type. It's very interesting. And again, my grandmother, probably at the age of, let's say, at least 75, I think it might have been around 80, to be honest, but I was at her house. I told you this story before several times, but she told me that her and her sister, she was born in 1912. I think her sister was born in 1910. They used to sit in the plains of Kansas, outside of Erie, Kansas, in the lower uh, southeast corner, and they would stare at these flying cigars that didn't have any sound. they just float by. They didn't look like Zeppelins. But they just flowed by, and she said, we just used to watch them. And they're children, so they don't have this alarm. Now, I don't know if she said there was any smoke out the back or anything like that, but the other more modern version of that particular ship, of course, you know, we got the year uh, 2020 models now, is a flying cylinder, uh, like a really elongated tin can with sharp edges, you know, like flat edges, like it's literally been extruded and cut at both sides. People said they've seen those. And what's interesting about seeing that is it's kind of like the cruise ship in Fifth Element with windows. As if they're just having tours of Earth looking down on us. I think there's something wonderful about that if that's true. Because that kind of means, well, they have the concept of entertainment or scientific exploration. But just to observe, for me, indicates sort of a class structure or at least a uh, discipline structure within their society. Because in our minds, all great aliens are exactly the same. All whatever aliens exactly the same. They're all the same. They all are engineers. They're all pilots. They all do exactly the same thing. But that vehicle, if it exists, suggests that there's a populace that just wants to observe. They don't need to get out on the ground and do something. We have crop circles. And there's... Fairly interesting footage out there that that claims that these, you know, these flying discs zip around on top of a crop and all of a sudden just poof, this thing lays down and it's got this crazy geometric pattern in the middle of a desert. I mean, in the middle of a field, excuse me. It'd be cool in the desert, right? What would be the purpose of that? Well, the shape, if it were real would probably indicate something of a star map, of a molecule, of something scientific. I don't know that those associations have ever been made in a legitimate crop circle. But it's to show you something of intelligent design that you can't refuse. It's not an anomaly. It's not a tornado that happened to just touch down and make a little circle. What's interesting is I come from Kansas where there's plenty of little tornadoes here and there, lots of hay, lots of wheat. And I know that without, without knowing when and where, you're in the middle of a storm, you know, a little funnel comes down, touches the ground for literally a split second, and then the anomaly of the funnel gets disrupted by the weather and it, goes, it just gets dissipated. And I don't know that any farmer has ever rumored, oh man, I, I found this patch of my territory flattened and, you know, interwoven. Because the big distinction with crop circles was that when it's legitimate, the strands of whatever it is, right? Hay, wheat, something like that. They're interwoven like a tapestry. They're not technically broken, in, at least in any major way. But when a human being, you know, puts a big spike in the field, ties a rope to a, uh, a plank that has, a, it's like a T plank, right? And so they grab the T that comes up. It's not even a T, it's an L and so they grab the, the part that comes up to their hands and they're carefully walking and stomping down the stuff and creating a very man-made crop circle, which has been done more times than anything that's claimed to be legitimate, that they're breaking all of the, all of the, the organic matter coming out of the ground. It's actually severed and broken because the human being stepping on it. The other question we don't, really look at and it's amazing how there's been you know hundreds of ufo shows put on the sci-fi channel discovery channel history channel whatever 
and they just they're so shallow it's unbelievable they don't ask any decent questions which almost suggests that the ufologists themselves are shallow people and i i know that's not the case but why am i having to ask questions i've never heard before that seem to be very logical questions the other question is this if you were them and you had to warm up their society to your existence and maybe for them, first contact was almost first contact. Roswell crash happens. The uh, Puget Sound crash happens, but we don't actually have a vehicle that drops down so you can see it. But a guy broke his arm. His dog got killed. No, his kid broke his arm and his dog got killed. And he took photographs that were then X'd out. Men in black are said to be being, uh, said to have shown up. Seen by half a dozen people. Very dramatic event of three to four vehicles flying uh, through the Puget Sound Bay, just spewing this molten stuff. And he took a, he got a picture taken of him holding up some of this molten, which almost looks like electrified um, aluminum. Maybe that's the reason why they felt like, uh, well, you know, maybe we should go down and kind of explain ourselves because we don't want to have them freak out and build a big defense shield that we got to deal with when we come back in. But what would the pulse be? What would the frequency be if they were to decide to go ahead and make contact? They know, I'm, I'm assuming, that they understand that there's a government that has control, that there's individuals on any one planet that have control through money manipulation or whatever, and that they're not going to want to surrender any of that control. They should know that negotiations are always going to be a shark tank of, well, we're going to try and maintain as much control as possible, so that when you do come, you really don't have 100% power because we still want what we have. And, you know, the, the funny negotiation point of an alien coming down might be, well, we're going to distribute all the wealth evenly. We're going to distribute all the food evenly. Education will be absolute for every human being. And we will work hard to make sure that your least educated individual on this planet achieves a proportional education to the most wealthy, opulent brainiac in the world. I mean, could you just see Prince Philip just going into cardiac arrest? Oh my God. And then what would the aliens do with myths? You know, like I said the other day, I had to sit and watch a PBS special, which again, they, they want to call all of the internet crap. You know, when someone says, I look something up on the internet, immediately you go, oh my God, what's going to come out of this person's mouth? But at the same time, you could turn to PBS and they've actually run one of probably many specials trying to prove that King Arthur was a real being. Right. Yeah. His father summoned uh, Merlin and struck a deal to bang this chick next door. And he summons the breath of Uther Pendragon to, to disguise him and let him ride his horse over the ocean, you know, suddenly up a cliff too, which is funny. Hilarious. And so what if there was any clarity of existence, would an alien race do with that? They would need to get rid of the myths of what man has created so that man could deal with true reality. Because how could you enjoy reality if you're living inside myths your whole life, right? I think one of the... Uh, the things that I would fear if they ever got here was that if they had developed a, a non-spiritual form such that they can't see things that human beings can see. They never interact with those that pass. They have no theory for what happens to you when you die except for just you fizzle out. And like you're just, you're nothing. It's oblivious. When... Most open-minded human beings, without even trying, have seen something, if not multiple somethings, that's, that don't have all the answers, but definitely prove that this ain't, this ain't it. We're, we're not living in one cosmology. Anyway, I thought you guys might dig that. This is definitely what's uh, been pulsing through my brain as they punch out all these uh, theories about uh, why these balloons are happening. What's probably going to happen, this is a Sunday, I'm going to try to get this out tomorrow. But what's probably going to happen is some other stuff's going to drop and this will seem incomplete. So if that's the case, it's just because something else dropped on the day I was editing it. Anyway, if you haven't gone to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. All the links you need are up there to the PayPal and Patreon folks. Thank you so much. 
Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.